is Victoria Kisache Kanobe. I work for UNESCO ICPA as a senior program coordinator for capacity development for education, but I'm also a focal point for the Kicks Africa 19 Hub uh, at UNESCO. So I just want to welcome everybody uh, that is joining us for the first time. In East Africa, it's an afternoon. It's uh, 2 past 15 or 3 p.m. And I know that in West Africa, it's still morning. And I can see colleagues are connecting from different uh, regions in China and everywhere. So you're very, very welcome to this uh, webinar. And uh, I don't know if my colleague Marianne has joined. Uh, she's going to be one of the moderators that is going to be taking us to the very first session. But I just have one announcement to make that it would be nice to hear from you. Uh, please use the chat room uh, to type your name, your organization and designation, and let us know where you're connecting from. You are all very, very welcome. The webinar is uh, jointly organized by the Kicks Africa 19 Hub, but principally by UNESCO ICBA and Associates for Change uh, who are based in Ghana. You'll be hearing more about this webinar. So just give it a, a few seconds, type your name, introduce yourself, and then we shall begin. I can see colleagues from Mozambique. You're very welcome, very, very welcome. And then the other announcement is we shall be using the chat room in case you have any comments, any observations, any contributions, since we have a very short time and we may not all utilize the space to share our views. So our speakers are ready and um, I should be handing over to my colleague, Marianne. Thank you. Looks like my colleague Marianne is not yet connected online. Uh, she's connecting from the US. So allow me to quickly start off the program by inviting our representative for the director, uh, Mr. Salyu Sal, to give his opening remarks. Over to you, Salyu. Thank you very Thank you much. Very much. Have some Hello. 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 First, first mute, and then we you you seem to be logged in twice. Is that better now? Better now? No. Better now, no. Better now, no. Sorry. Just just give it a minute. We, we remove one of your logins. I think it's being a challenge. Okay. okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Try again now. Yes. Can you hear me? It's better. It's better. Thank you. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Victoria. Uh, dear esteemed guests, esteemed colleagues, dear participants. Uh, as the moderator was saying, I'm Salim Sal, Senior Program Coordinator of UNESCO IGBA. And on behalf of uh, UNESCO IGBA's director, I'm delighted to welcome you all to this important webinar on accelerated education programs and girls-focused education models in West Africa. 
As we gather virtually today, we are reminded of the pressing challenge of out-of-school children and young people in our region. These young minds represent untapped potential and their exclusion from education is a significant barrier to achieving inclusive and equitable societies. We all know that the issue of out-of-school children in sub-Saharan Africa is complex and demand the urgent attention of governments, civil society, international organizations, and universities. It demands the attention of all of us here today. More than 32 million children of primary and lower secondary school aged just in the West, West Africa region are deprived of the right to education with girls unfortunately disproportionately affected. Girls and children from poor households, rural areas, and conflict-affected regions are at a high risk of dropping out. This is a staggering statistic that underscores the urgent need for innovative solutions. Children and youth who don't get the chance to complete their education are often sucked into a perpetual cycle of poverty and inequality. This cycle is of poverty, threatens hard-won economics and social development in the region. So you must be wondering, and I'll be wondering with you, what can be done? Today, we'll be learning about innovative models that are providing another chance for out-of-school children to engage in school. Models like accelerated education programs and girls-focused education in Ghana, Nigeria, and Sierra Leone are offering out-of-school children flexible, age-appropriate learning opportunities to children and adolescents who have missed out of, on schooling, allowing them to catch up with their peers and reintegrate into the formal education system. This kind of exchange of good practices is possible because or thanks to the Global Partnership for Education, Knowledge and Innovation Exchange Hub for 19, meaning Kicks Hub 19 in Eastern, Western and Southern Africa. Since the Kicks Hub 19's beginning in 2020, the Hub has pursued a, work, a vital mission to identify good practices in Sub-Saharan Africa, like accelerated education program for out-of-school children, and spark dynamic discussion about their evidence, results, and policy recommendations. We do hope that the discussion today make their way to influencing decision makers to adapt or adopt and fund programs like accelerated education programs and girls-focused education models. The fate and futures of millions of out-of-school children rest then in our hands. Allow me to thank you once again for attending this important dis discussion on behalf of UNESCO IGBA and the GPE Kicks Hub 19. I welcome everyone here and I look forward to engaging with you in discussion on best practices for out-of-school children and youth. I wish you all fruitful uh, deliberation. Thank you very much for your attention. Over to you, Victoria. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Saliu, uh, for those wonderful remarks. And uh, we really appreciate you creating the time to open the webinar for us. And colleagues, uh, we want to welcome all of you that have just joined us. And just to share that this webinar is about accelerated education programs and girls-focused education models in West Africa. And you're going to be listening in from the research that was done, the evidence that was generated, and the policy implications. So we are going to be hearing from a broad spectrum of speakers uh, that have been lined up for today. Uh, so that we hear what is working and what is not working and what needs to be to change 
as well as explore strategies and interventions uh, for scaling up some of these models uh, so that we have inclusive and equitable education for all our children in Africa and beyond. So I want to again hand over to my colleague, Marianne Joy, uh, who is right, right now connected to invite the next speaker. Over to you, Marianne. It looks like she's still not yet online. So let me go ahead and invite uh, Dr. Patrick Walgembe from IDRC, if he's present, okay. to give just quick remarks. Over to you, Dr. Patrick. If not online, I'll move to the next speaker in the interest of time so that we can utilize all the time that we have. Allow me, ladies and gentlemen, to invite our keynote speaker, who is Dr. Leslie Kersley Hayford, the Director for Associates for Change, who is going to be talking about cross-country findings on scaling up accelerated education programs. Over to you, Dr. Hayford. Leslie. Thank you, Victoria, and thank you, UNESCO Hub 19, for inviting us to share these results over the last four years. We've been working with IDRC GPE on these um, findings and the cross countries of Nigeria, Ghana, Sierra Leone. We welcome all the participants across Africa. I wonder if um, we, oh, they're gonna allow me to share here. Okay, um, I'll, just, I'll just go back. Okay, sorry. I think if we can, can we see? I, I'm just having a bit of a uh -huh. um I can't seem to get back to the original one but let me just see if I can go back um this way okay so um we're going to be talking this morning about a project that we've been working on in West Africa as I mentioned on scaling accelerated education programming across uh, West Africa, but it has implications for Sub-Saharan Africa in general. Um, this program was developed because of the rising numbers of out-of-school children on the continent, uh, the failure for all of us to address this issue of out-of-school children, and to also look specifically at girls' education in the, in the midst of that context. Um, Associates for Change, the Center for the Studies of Economies of Africa and Dalon have been working together as the research consortium. We have an international steering committee that includes Accelerated Education Working Group, the AEWG and others as well. Uh, most importantly, we have a, in all the countries, we have a policy learning working group, which is usually headed by the chief directors. And we have close collaboration with universities and education innovators on the, in West Africa. The education innovators are the ones that are actually putting the programs of accelerated education on the ground in the most remote and difficult areas of these countries, but they're also working very closely with government. Um, all the teams have experienced researchers and enumerators that are working with them as well. Um, uh, just to name a few of the universities that we're working with, we're with, with the Norman Patterson School in Canada, we're with the Real Centre in Cambridge that has done extensive work on out-of-school children. We also have the University of Ibadan, University of Sierra Leone, and University of Development Studies in Ghana. As mentioned, some of our international partners include Brookings, UNICEF, and, and UNESCO, who are leading this very important um, program in, in helping out of school children transition back into the mainstream and others. Some of the accelerated innovators that are mentioned are on the screen from Nigeria. We have Horn of Hope, Corno Bono, the majority of which these innovators are large scale national and in innovators. Um, we only have one or two international NGOs because during COVID we found that many of them had left the countries or due to funding crisis had left the areas of Northeast Nigeria um, and other parts of West Africa. So as we started up the program, we, we discovered that there were many national NGOs that were really well uh, positioned to take on this challenge. And we focused on those national NGOs, School for Life, Gilbit. Um, and then in Nigeria, we have the BRAC as well as we have Save the Children. 
The focus of this research is really to increase access. The main objective of the research is to increase access to learning for children who are out of school and through strength in knowledge, we are then looking at helping governments understand the effectiveness and efficiency, both cost as well as other, um, in terms of accelerated education and girls focused programs. So we're trying to build a knowledge um, pool of information for these governments and evidence that they can use to help them to design and scale up alternative pathways to learning in West Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa. The key points here in terms of the sub-objectives include building capacity of governments to adopt and scale up the accelerated programming and then helping governments and, and non-state actors also to accelerate their programs in terms of adapting to contexts in both emergency as well as extreme poverty zones and then to build the knowledge as I've mentioned. On the alignment with KICS, of course, they have systems transformation programs as well as girls education accelerators. We're very much aligned to helping governments to uh, take full advantage of the GPE KICS um, area, areas of support. We've worked with Nigeria and Ghana specifically. Sierra Leone has been able to capture some financing as well um, from the Qatar Fund. We have, so far, we've produced quite a few evidence pieces in terms of mapping studies, in terms of meta-analysis and out-of-school mapping. We have usually, each country produces the a research output for its governments, for its non-state actors, community, and then we do cross-country studies. Two of the ones that I would like to share today, and I'm sure um, Eunice will put it in the chat box, but the position paper for the UN um, transformation conference that was held a few years ago. And then most recently, we had a high level conference that tried to address the Africa Union's year of education. We've also been working on policy briefs and research briefs that are available on our website. And I put the link there for anyone that wants to find out. Just a bit of background. The numbers of out of school children in West Africa have been increasing, especially in Nigeria. And as many of you know, that is the main problem. The main challenge that we have is when a country of that, the high proportion of, of the population increases in out of school children, it's moved from about 14, 15,000 when we started the project, 14 million, sorry, out of school children to now 19 and over. Some predictions show that it's around 20 million children. So in Ghana's case, again, when we started the project it was about 650,000. Uh, the la latest census shows that it's 1.2 million. What's interesting, the research that we've been doing in the last four years really shows that the barriers persist. These barriers have been around for over 20 years. The supply and demand barriers in rural deprived and extreme poverty zones of the continent persist and have worsened due to conflict. In cases like um, Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger, their schools have closed. The six, over 6,000 schools have closed in Burkina Faso due to conflict. So there's an increasing number of vulnerability issues around budget allocation to the primary sector is, is also worrying. These are reasons why there are increasing numbers of out-of-school children. And um, just to show a little bit about the UIS data sets, these are available. Again, I'll, I'll share the PowerPoint. What do we bring to the table? So far, the context has shown that Ghana has made incredible um, strides in putting together uh, legislative documentation and, and passing an act of parliament to create what is called the Complementary Education Agency. It is now the driver to supporting non-state actors in the field and also scaling up accelerated education in Ghana. Nigeria has also institutionalized and tried to ad, ad, address the out of school challenge by also having a ni nationwide strategy and they are the most um, developed in terms of curriculum. They have three levels of curriculum for primary, junior and senior high school for integrating accelerated education programming into their um, um, education architecture. For instance, in Nigeria, they have uh, the basic education a program that has been developed as an alternative and uh, complementary pathway for children that are out of school. We have Sierra Leone, which has also just recently developed its national strategy on out of school ch um, children, as well as they have guidelines on 
um, AEPs to uh, assist in the scaling up of uh, accelerated education models in West Africa. I just want us to look quickly before the speakers talk about um, their, their areas of, of um, research in terms of learning outcomes. Dr. James will speak on that and then they'll have cost effectiveness from Nigeria and others. But the main focus of this um, particular slide is to look at the difference in AEPs. We have three different types of AEPs that we've been researching. The speed school system, which is a collapsed approach. It's a collapsed system from six years of primary to three years. Complementary basic, which is a non-formal approach to having children have their foundation literacy skills when they've dropped out or never been to school. They transition after one year back into the formal system. That CB approach is going on in both Nigeria and Ghana. The speed school model is mainly in Burkina Faso and, and Sierra Leone, and we've been doing research currently in Sierra Leone. And then the final model is girls empowerment model, which cuts across all three countries, but we've been working mainly in Ghana and Sierra Leone, looking at the foundation literacy approach within the AEP models, but also the income generation that's needed for teenage mothers and others to transition back into the formal system. I won't have time to go into this in much detail, but just to point out that most accelerated education programs really focus on foundation literacy, numeracy, and life skills. And some of them have the added component, as I mentioned, of income generation or skills development so that girls particularly can move back into the formal system or go into the apprenticeship area. So the research design, I'm going to just um, end on two slides, which is the research design and the call for governments to act on scaling up um, accelerated education. Um, first of all, we, we conducted a very extensive literature review over the first year. Um, that's available on our website. We also did a longitudinal, two, long, two tracker studies year two and year three, and we're about to finalize the last one in year four. These tracker studies tracked over um, a, a thousand children in most of the countries through um, tracing them back to their communities where they had completed AEPs and then tracking them through the primary, junior and senior high school levels of education. So some of them had been out of the AEP program for over five or seven years, and they had transitioned and completed those formal education systems. Others had gone into the world of work and were tracking them as well in apprenticeship as well as in self-employment. So altogether, we had a cohort of over 3,000 children over the four-year period, and we traced them in, in the world of work as well as in the formal education system to see if they completed education, what were their learning outcomes, and what were their life outcomes based on their accelerated education findings. Um, accelerated education experience. As I mentioned, um, this is building on previous experience of uh, evidence generated by Real and Cambridge and others that shows that basically AP children that skip four years of education, they skip primary one to four, often are transitioned back into primary four or five, and they were seen uh, in our research at par in terms of their learning outcomes. And Dr. James will go into much more detail on that. Um, we also found that they were quite resilient in staying in senior high, uh, staying in the, um, the formal education system, but the poverty often knocked them back out of the system. Um, in junior high school, they were striving to complete basic education, but because of poverty, they often were unable to sustain that process without working in the formal in, in outside school systems. Cost effectiveness, it's very clear, and uh, Bahago will be talking about it, but uh, the AEP programs are about one third the cost of what for one year of formal education is costing. And in this case, we skip four years of primary schooling. So it's a very great cost share savings approach for governments. And 95 of the CB learners and AEP learners aspire to go back into formal education. About 90% of them do make it back, especially girls. Um, okay, now the commitment to action, which was just a commitment that we, um, we've been having high level meetings with governments across West Africa in the last month. And I know Victoria was very 
vocal and, and active in that um, um, high level meeting that we held in Ghana. And the communique from that meeting is available. Again, Eunice can post it on the chat box here. Um, but basically what we were asking for was a commitment of about five to 10% of the basic education budget for out of school children. And this would allow for both state and non-state actors to collaborate on scaling up out of uh, uh, the uh, accelerated education programming and what have you. Um, we've also had a strong um, synergy around the continent or around West Africa, looking at the legislative instruments that have been worked on. So we have a fairly strong um, basis on which we are trying to communicate with the AU and others of the need for um, scaling up accelerated education. What do the countries bring to the table? I've mentioned already that Nigeria's curriculum, the policies have been developed in Ghana. There's an act of parliament and there's curriculum basis as well. Um, our research really, really strive to focus on the scaling strategies, how do countries scale up um, accelerated education? We found top down as well as bottom up approaches were working in these countries, mainly driven by non-state actors, but we also engaged with the government actors and more and more in this case of Sierra Leone, Nigeria and Ghana, they all put in place um, um, mechanisms to help their, their countries to scale up, but at varied, varied levels. We have a political economic analysis to that effect, which is available on our website to see the feasibility of these programs in scaling up. We also work very closely with um, the ROSI program to um, that's the Brookings Institute scalability studies to help us with that. So in Ghana's case, we see that AEPs are decreasing the number of out of school children, increasing enrollment in primary schools and improving completion rates of basic education, particularly when we're looking at deprived rural areas and when we're looking at marginalized populations such as girls. A large proportion of this cohorts have been able to transition to junior high school. So this is a big win for AEPs. We've seen that most of the children transitioned to upper primary, transitioned into the junior high school, but we are still trying to um, uh, look at the data in terms of the completion at junior high school. This will be the last year we do the study. It will be focused on assessing whether they complete junior high school or transition into the world of work. Um, and we'll talk more about that in the, in the webinar. Nigeria's pathway for out of school children also looks very viable because the government now is pursuing what they call an open learning process in Nigeria, an open schooling process, which AEP curriculum will be used in that way. We've had a lot of outcomes in both Sierra Leone. The Sierra Leone Ministry of Education has been highly supportive of this program and, and the research uptake. They've taken up the research and they've been able to win Qatar funding, and they've embedded it in their GP uh, frameworks. Niger Ghana is yet, we're yet to see if Ghana embeds it in the GP framework for Ghana, and we're yet to see in Nigeria how far it's gone. But Nigeria has been working on a girls um, accelerator, which we're hoping we can also link up with them. The, the evidence, therefore, has had impact in terms of sharing with policymakers and non-state actors the way forward in scaling up. And we have a lot of ex examples of this and I've just put on the, the last couple of slides. I wanna get to the slide that has really got, this is where um, the importance, I, I don't know, Victoria, do I have two more minutes before the end? Can you just indicate how many minutes I have before we, I have to pass on, yeah. Almost used up. So just wrap up in two, two minutes. <laughs> thank you, thank you, my dear, thanks. So for governments to reach the targets of SDG 4, we know that if they don't address out of school children and, and use low cost methodologies, not using infrastructure, not building new schools, but trying to get low cost solutions for the out of school challenge in West Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa, it is unlikely the SDG 4 will be reached. All governments, this is the call that I talked about, that the high-level meeting that included Nigeria, Ghana, Sierra Leone, and as well Mali and Burkina Faso. And we are scaling up our work in these other countries like Liberia, Burkina Faso, um, Niger, as well as um, other places in West Africa. And we're asking governments in the sub-region 
and across Sub-Saharan Africa to consider 7% of their basic education budget to tackling the out-of-school crisis and the learning crisis because of dropout on the continent using accelerated education modalities, which include um, speed schools, complementary basic education, and what have you. We also recognize that APs and national and education systems um, need policy and legislative instruments, which are available as well in West Africa. We want governments to develop a roadmap and an action plan, which we can share in the coming weeks. We will have the conference document and the report from the conference to share with all of you that shows some of the roadmap that was developed for West Africa. We're building on accelerated education working group um, frameworks as well. We would like to urge governments in collaboration with civil society to develop and test the AEP curriculums that are available in Nigeria, Ghana, Sierra Leone to scale up their programs in these countries. Most importantly, we think that it's needed to have what we call com community-based teachers, which, which are evolving out of these AEP programs to be properly, adequately um, supported by the wage bill and to use that wage bill in a way that will allow for rural remote areas to adapt their and to benefit from their um, government budgets in the areas of teacher teacher education and teacher training and most of all, importantly wage bill the governments should collaborate with institutions community facilitators to transition into those distance education programs so they can acquire teacher certification so once they are abp facilitators they become teachers and finally to start community driven approaches to sustaining aeps on the continent requires that governments build a, um, an environment which they can support communities, local facilitators to sustain um, CB and accelerated education programming. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks Thank so you to. so much, uh, Dr. Leslie, uh, Kersley Hayford for those uh, wonderful uh, remarks in the keynote presentation. So, I won't unpack it, but you've um, explained a lot of things to us very, very well. And I see already comments are coming through in terms of people seeking to understand more. Allow me colleagues to hand over to uh, my colleague Eunice uh, to take us through the next session, which is a panel session. Over to you, Eunice. Eunice? Eunice, do we have you online? Eunice, yes. are you online? Yes. Go ahead, Eunice. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Leslie, for the keynote address. So next on the agenda, we have panel presentations. We have three panel presentations, and each presenter has 15 minutes to deliver their presentation. The first is on the impact and effectiveness of AEPs on foundation learning. And this will be done by Dr. James Natia Adam, who is the research lead for Associates for Change. Over to you, Dr. James. Right, thank you, Eunice. Can you kindly project my presentation? Mm -hmm. Right, welcome to the presentation on investigating the impact and effectiveness of accelerated education programs on foundation learning in West Africa. Indeed, this presentation will dwell on to the outcomes of accelerated education programs in addressing educational challenges in West Africa, with particular focus in Ghana, Nigeria, and Sierra Leone. My name is Dr. James Nati Adam, I'm the Senior Research Lead at Associates for Change, Accra, Ghana. And I'm delighted to share our findings and insights with you today. Indeed, I am certain that by the end of my presentation, you will take away one key message, which is that as related education programs play a crucial role in bridging educational gaps and fostering socioeconomic development in West Africa. In fact, by addressing the needs of out-of-school children and providing them alternative paths, pathways to education, 
as related education programs, not only will it enhance learning outcomes, but of course, it will also contribute to a broader goal of socioeconomic progress in the sub region. Therefore, supporting and scaling these programs, as Dr. Leslie earlier mentioned, is essential for ensuring that every child has the opportunity to succeed and contribute to their community and well being. In this background and context, I will say that the out of school children represent a significant global challenge, which is exacerbated by economic difficulties, cultural norms, and conflicts. In countries like Ghana, Nigeria, and Sierra Leone, these countries face severe issues of out of school children. For instance, Nigeria alone faces about 20 million children who are currently out of school. But wait for a moment. The impact of out of school children is indeed profound. And studies have suggested that in Sierra Leone, for example, in, in, during the Ebola endemic and COVID crisis situation, the out of school children suffered a staggering 73% of loss in literacy alone. Indeed, the study did not even venture to look at the numeracy. But this particular presentation will show how AEP is trying to address this challenge. Shockingly for us, one out of five children aged six to 11 years, one out of three children aged 12 to 14 years, and of course, 60% of youth aged 15 and 17 years are currently out of school. And as I said, addressing these challenges is crucial for ensuring every child has the opportunity to learn and thrive wherever the child is found. Louis Eunice, next. Hello, you. Dr. James. Hi, Dr. James. Dr. James? Okay, so I'll just um, come in here for a few minutes until he gets back. So I mentioned, we've mentioned that there's been an impact on the effectiveness of enhancing the learning on AEPs. Yes, Dr. I'm back, I'm back. Good, okay, thank you. It's a network, sorry for that, please. So on the problem statement, I in West Africa, the number of children, the number of children out of school aged five to 16 years is alarming. In fact, with Nigeria alone accounting for nearly 20 million. Despite this, several governments within the South African continent have not sufficiently invested in alternative ed pathways to basic education. And therefore, this impacts, therefore, the impacts and effectiveness of accelerated education program in improving learning outcomes remain unclear, largely due to the lack of comprehensive research. This gap is and this gap in understanding impedes effective policy making and limits the support for AEP investment and scaling in sub-Saharan Africa. As a result, many out-of-school children continue to be left to be left behind or missing crucial opportunities for education and empowerment. Eunice, next slide. Well, this presentation focuses on one of the five research questions of the project. Specifically, the presentation centers on the broad research question one, which is what is the effectiveness, efficiency, and adaptability of the education innovation in relation to the out of school population and girls? Eunice? Eunice, our methodology. Yes. So our research employed a mixed methods approach investigating both qualitative and quantitative methods to explore and also evaluate 
accelerated education programs. And within the context of Ghana, we say complementary basic education. So we evaluated this in Ghana, Nigeria, and Sierra Leone. We use the stratified random sampling to select out of school children enrolled in AEPs, and data was gathered through structured interviews, questionnaire or survey, focus group discussion, and checklist. The data collection involved face-to-face -face interactions with learners and teachers in the various schools that we sampled or selected for this research. While analysis includes descriptive statistics such as tables, percentages, and graphs, we also did thematic analysis of the qualitative data. In fact, for this, for the purpose of this presentation, we zoom down to assess learner progress, and therefore we use the ESA annual, the annual status of education report, that is ESA, at the basic level. Then we we'll also use the secondary grade reading assessment at the junior high school level and the senior high school level for tracker one and tracker two. Indeed, this comprehensive approach aims to provide a nuanced understanding of AEP's effectiveness and impact across the three countries. Eunice, next. All right, so in overall, the Education Innovators programs that we studied transitioned over 90% of AEP learners into the formal system. For example, the table here gives the transition of AEP in formal education in the context of Ghana alone. The, thought, the people that the trackers, the tracker one and two that we study, shows that about 1,235 learners transitioned into the formal um, system. Of this, we have more females transitioning than males. And during the study, about 46% of these learners were at the junior high school level, whereas 24% were at the senior school level. So the tracker one and study focus on this category of actors or learners that we assess to determine how AEP is impacting on their learning outcomes. So I now move on to share with you some of the research findings or results. Eunice, next. Yes, so the annual status of education report tracker one learning outcomes by intervention and gender. Because of time, I'll focus, by, I'll focus my presentation on only intervention. The gender aspect will be taken by my uh, colleague who will come immediately after my presentation. The graph you see on your left is the ASA reading proficiency in English language by intervention with respect to GADA. The results show that if you look at um, WED, we have 29% of learners in non-intervention area compared to 32% of learners in intervention areas who are showing reading proficiency in English. This shows that the AEP in the AEP intervention areas are rapidly experiencing proficiency in reading compared to the non-intervention areas. And factors that account for this is because of the kind of curriculum that they take these learners to. If you contrast that with Nigeria, the results looks similar. In fact, in the case of Nigeria, it is about 30% and 32% between intervention and non-intervention. What is striking for us is that these AAP learners went through only nine months of formal tuition at the community level compared to those who are in the formal system already, who have already spent beyond four to five years of formal education system. So the resource here is remarkably superb and it's convincing that AEP is one of the cardinal points through which um, children who are out of school can gain rapid uh, reading proficiency. Next slide, Eunice. Eunice, next slide. Victoria, Eunice? are you the one controlling the right. slides? So the next slide talks about, the next slide is about, um, Annual Status Education Report, ASA Numeracy. Please, ASA Numeracy, we've, we've passed this place. So in, the, in, in case of numeracy, the focus is on multiplication and division of numbers between one to nine digits. And the results show that 34% of AEP learners versus 31% of non-AEP learners 
or non AEP intervention zones were able to do simple multiplication and divisions. But the findings is in contrast with Nigeria. In Nigeria, it is about 27% 27 in intervention and 25% in non intervention areas. Almost similar, but the issue is that the numeracy performance rate is small in, in Ghana compared to Nigeria. That was for tracker one. How about tracker one for those who are the junior high school level and then the senior high school level? We administered what we call, we conducted the secondary grade reading assessment with these learners. Next slide. Several word reading competencies by intervention. Ghana, the results show that, it's the next slide please. The results show that about 46% of, of learners of AAP districts or communities, uh, communities performed or achieved basic competence exceptionally well than the non-intervention communities or districts that was about 28%. If you contrast that with Nigeria, we realize that the non-AEP learners was about 49% higher or more than the AEP learners in terms of work reading competence by intervention. Please, my presentation is higher. I'm, I've passed where you, you, are, you are showing. So I'm looking at the tracker two because of time. I'm looking at the tracker two. Yeah. Yes, I just explained this. So please, two. you have about two minutes. Yes, so two I'm just minutes. winding up. So the yeah. tracker two shows that, next slide, please. Tracker two shows that about 33, tracker two, yes. About 33, next, next, 30. Next, please. Next slide. Yes, here. This was administered, no, this was administered, go back, learners after the senior, yes. So this was conducted at the senior high school level. And the result shows that 33% of AEP learners were achieved basic competence exceptionally well compared to 26% of learners who were in the non-AEP intervention areas. And this is remarkably good. If you look at the story of these learners that they had only nine months of Tuition in the non-formal or in the uh, complement in the uh, accelerated education program compared to their counterparts who were already in the system. Please let's move on to the qualitative research finding just to present on one. Please slides next one. Yes, yes. What we can say is that our research findings show that the AEP curriculum is value based and engenders a sense of service to the communities, especially agrarian communities, because these learners or AEP learners want to farm or do the agrarian activities along pursuing formal education or AEPs. This suggests that many of the AEP learners are resilient and orient themselves to academic success once mainstreamed. Indeed, the aspirations of these AEP learners are high as they attempt to stay and complete basic education, even though they still face poverty. What is striking to us is that girls are even negotiating out of early marriage to transition back to formal school. Next slide, just one statement. This is the holistic life accounts of one of the AEP beneficiaries who stated that it was during this period that I realized that I can't do any work without education. So I decided to travel back home to go to school. For, to go to school. Fortunately for me, the CB program was in session. So I joined and through hard work, I have been able to transition up to senior high school level. In conclusion, next slide. AEP are providing contextually relevant education solutions for out-of-school children by providing them fun foundational learning in terms of literacy and in terms of numeracy as well as life skills. Indeed, as related education programs enables children to skip three to four years of formal schooling yet have equivalent level of competencies in literacy and numeracy and sometimes even surpasses their colleagues who are already in the formal system. De therefore, this study is recommending that the central government should resource AEP providers, both the government that is a complementary education agency and the non-governmental ag agencies that are delivering accelerated education programs at scale to ensure that marginalized children and youth have entry into, have a secondary, have a second pathway of achieving foundational level. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. James. That was a very revealing presentation on the impact and effectiveness of AEPs on foundation learning. 
Um, the next presentation is on the effectiveness of AEPs from a gender and social inclusion perspective. And to do this, we have Madam Fatu Yamkela, who is the director of the Land Development Consultants in Sierra Leone. Madam Fatu, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, um, okay, so Eunice, we could go straight on to the slides. Thank you. Right. Um, I'm Fatou Yumkela, and I'm the research manager in the consortium um, of the, the IDRCGP um, supported study. Next slide. Right. Um, um, as we would all recall, all the global platforms for education um, tend to underscore the importance of um, equity in education status for girls as well as boys. Um, all the platforms, Education for All, um, um, the Millennium um, Development Challenge and the Sustainable Development Goals all emphasize this, um, the need to make sure that we promote gender equality and empower women um, in the context of education. Um, the same is true for IDRC. IDRC is committed to gender equality, equity, inclusion, and empowerment. Next slide. Next slide. Right. Um, IDRC um, um, encourages uh, researchers to examine findings um, um, that are relevant for gender along set, um, a number of domains. I'm looking at the context looking at transition and uh, looking at um, an outcomes, not only from the learning perspective, but also from a, an empowerment perspective. So if we look at the context, um, what you will see in the, on your screen is if, um, the Sierra Leone context in which we examined um, um, the, the girl empowerment model that was implemented by BRAC, the Save the Children Speed model, um, 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 implemented within that uh, timeline, and also the Ministry of Education um, um, that implemented accelerated learning programs for girls who are dropped out of school during, during the Ebola period. And all these programs were implemented within a context of, um, in Sierra Leone that we know, uh, we established that high, uh, out of school children, the scope of out of school children is relatively high, we're seeing at 22% for our very rural areas where our mapping study was conducted. And the drivers already, I think, um, Leslie already highlighted them in, in her presentation. So sociocultural factors, uh, factors associated with orphanhood, foster age, and teenage pregnancy. The same is true for Ghana. Next slide. In Ghana, um, the context of our research was around the complementary education, which uh, Dr. James has em emphasized, the nine month speed model that were implemented by the innovators that are highlighted, AfriKids, Gilbert, School for Life, and within. All of this, I mean, in Ghana, the programs targeted both boys and girls, and in the barriers to, to education are similar, no different. Next slide. But in, yeah, in both the Ghana models and the Sierra Leone models, community ownership in all of these was, were, was key. So Dr. James touched on transition and we picked out a more detailed uh, data sets on transition for Ghana. What you're seeing is the transition data for the um, Gilbert. Um, if, you, if you look at the, the extreme right, the transition rate into primary school it is extremely high. So regardless of gender, we're seeing an overall transition of about 89%. So for girls, for, for boys, regardless um, 
of the sort of level, if you check the, the transition rate um, among the two groups, gender groups are quite high. They, they go through the nine months speed model and then enter into primary school. Next slide. I won't be labeled here. This is uh, the, the school for life. The pattern is the same. Overall transition rate was 86%. Um, so uh, this, I mean, we're now looking at um, effect, um, effectiveness in terms of learning outcomes. Dr. James looked at, um, you know, the focus for Ghana was that for um, the primary level transitioning into GSS. For Sierra Leone, our focus was um, um, looking at AP, those who have gone through the AP program and are now at the JSS and SSS level. We also apply the SEGRA test, which um, the components are looking at word reading and reading and comprehension. Next slide. Next slide. But in the Sierra Leone, um, 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 the, the results I'm giving for learning outcomes are, are examples from Sierra Leone. In Sierra Leone, if you look at, I mean, forgetting first about whether they are in intervention or non-intervention, just look at the overall performance, look at gender. We found that the boys, boys in, in, in our sample, regardless of which group cohort, uh, were performing a lot better. They were um, 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 higher, they, their average score was a lot higher uh, and it's significant than, 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 than girls. But however, if you look at within the groups, looking at um, those who were in the intervention groups, blue bars, AAP against the non-intervention groups, um, um, non-AAPs, the, the difference is not um, significant. So, I mean, again, that speaks to the same conclusion that Dr. James was saying that even though you have um, 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 children who had only gone through, say the speed models of three years, when they get to uh, secondary school, when they transition and get into the formal school, they're performing just as well as the, those who have not been in the intervention. For reading and comprehension, um, um, the scores are even, I mean, were even out. This time we did not see uh, a big dif difference at all between boys and girls. If you look at both, regardless of whether they were in the intervention group or not. Uh, um, uh, however, within each gender group, in this case, the non-AEP, that is the non-intervention, um, those who've been through regular government schooling or the government recommended um, um, sort of pace of schooling performed a little better than AEPs. And this is for junior secondary. So the next slide, we would look at what did we see when we tracked down um, the, the, the AEP beneficiaries who had actually achieved to senior secondary school. The first thing we found was that we didn't have enough boys in the cohort to be able to do a comparative analysis, but we found enough girls to do the comparative. What, what that is telling us is that the girls are the one who tend to have pursued up to secondary level. Again, we see in this case that those who are in the intervention groups did perform a better than those in the in the in the AEP group. However, I mean they are they are actually reaching the, the proficient level, whereas the non-AEP are surpassing the proficient level. But but again, they, they achieve the passing score and um and we just need to look more into what is going on. Why would AEPs, I mean those who've gone through the AEP uh, exposure be lagging behind a little bit when it comes to reading and comprehension. Next slide. Next slide. The next couple of slides um, uh, will look at effectiveness. Um, since we are, our study is looking at uh, uh, effectiveness, is more from a qualitative. We should keep in mind that um, our study was actually, you know, sort of um, um, looking more to deep dive into the reasons of, of, of what is going on and, um, and, and how the perspectives of those who've gone through the, the AAP. Now, what you have at the top 
would be the key messages. This is from Ghana. The first this slide that is that is uh, projected now. What we're seeing is that we're seeing a breakthrough for reading and writing. And if you take a moment to to look at the quotes, um, just take a look at the second quote. I couldn't write my name, but after the CBE, I can now write my name, and that is a female um who had achieved up to P6 level from Saboba District in Ghana. Um, next slide. I think that's Ghana again. Ghana. Again, the message we're getting, I think that was also underscored by Dr. James, that AEP stimulate resilience, confidence, and empowerment. In when we, we did our interview, we get a lot of that, that uh that those who've gone through the AEP program are now feeling much more empowered. Take the first bullet point. You now have confidence in myself to stay in school and complete because I can now read and write well. And again, a female P6 student in Yendi district. Next slide. Next slide. For, the, for, for Sierra Leone, we, the key message we picked out is that not only the confidence beats, but that it also strengthens economies. And that is remember that in the Sierra Leone sample, we had the BRAC, um, children who have been, I mean, uh, beneficiaries who've been exposed to the BRAC model in which they were, um, they are, they, it's a girl's empowerment model. So we see a lot of them who've gone back to the world of work now feel very empowered about, you know, what they've been able to achieve as a result of the AEP, exposure to the AEP. But what is also striking for Sierra Leone is what you see projected, is that we're saying that is uh, AEP is, act, is uh, serving as a prevention strategy against teenage pregnancy and reduces the incidence of child marri marriage. Um, we, we, we extracted this quote. I learned that early sex is not good and that one should abstain from sex and, uh, and if you don't want to get pregnant. Then, I mean, we, we also got to know that they were actually exposed on how to prevent pregnancy. And, um, and, and uh, again, that AEPs actually um, broach the subject of how of contraceptives and the benefits. So again, we're seeing that um, um, the, the whole, we see that the, one of the factors that, that um, impedes girls from going to is that they, they get pregnant at an early age. So if AEPs are dealing with that subject in an open and transparent manner, and the, and the beneficiaries are recognizing the value, then they're more likely to abstain for sex or use preventive measures. Next slide. Next slide. I think those are the quotes. Once we get to the next slide, this would be what are our recommendations? Um, because having seen that, uh, I think the results are really supporting each other. What um, 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 the Ghana study was showing versus what the Sierra Leone study looking particularly at gender. So um, Eunice, could we look at the recommendation slide? It's the last but one. So we're seeing that APs are making the difference. Even though that, even though that um, um, AEPs are applying different models as to the formal system that have the luxury of six years in schooling, whereas speed models are doing three years, some are doing less. The CB in Ghana is even doing nine months. We're seeing that, I mean, I mean, they are exiting pool and equally effective as those who've gone to the normal. So our recommendation into the government the IDRC support has started painting the picture that yes, the AAPs and CBEs are effective. So we shouldn't stop that um, donors or um, I mean agency that are on uh, this um, a webinar should continue support research activities to continue measure the effectiveness of AAPs in reducing number of, of, of out of school children. Linked to that, we know that the, the, the likelihood of dropout, the likelihood of um, not going to school at all would be in extreme poverty zones. So, I mean, those should be the focus areas when governments are looking at targeting um, CBE 
and, and AAP programs. Then um, as we're, we're beginning to see in Sierra Leone, it can also be the weapon we've been looking for to reduce teenage pregnancy and early marriage. So that should also look at, government should look at it. In Sierra Leone, the signs are looking positive as, um, as uh, Leslie mentioned, with a strategy in place, with guidelines for a, um, AEP facilitation now in place and with, uh, with, with funding obtained by the government uh, by by Qatar by the Qatar funding to scale up AEP, so the landscape is looking promising. For education education innovators, that is all those we worked with, and whom we worked with us to study their programs. We encourage them to continue to apply the girl centered approach. The Ghana model was seeing the recruitment of fifty fifty girl boys. The Sierra Leone models were most all virtually girls. I mean and um. And I think the Nigeria model was also is also mixed. But we think that applying the girl-centered approach will continue to reduce um, school number of out-of-school children and 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 provide an alternative pathway, especially for teenage mothers. But we um, we don't want to lose the sight where that we're seeing gender disparities in reading proficiency. We're seeing gender disparities. I mean especially in the Sierra Leone context, uh, between males and females. And we need to look into that. I mean, uh, uh, um, many of you, I'm sure if you put it in the comment column, perhaps it's the issue of the other, you know, girls who tend to have other uh, responsibilities. Once they go back after the exposure to an AP session, they have to go home, they have to do household chores and the like, and so may not have enough time as the boys to pursue you know, um, um, like studying or doing homeworks and the like. So I think we need to look into that and the implication. So even though our communities are very strong partners in the Sierra Leone context, they're really helping out um, with um, with uh, some are providing the the facilities where the OEP classes and others in Sierra Leone have actually come come up with bylaws. To, to insist that households send their girls to the AAP. They're doing quite a lot, but we still feel that we need to look at more into what the communities can do to increase their contribution to AAPs. So thank you very much for this opportunity. And um, we look forward to a more dialogue if you have questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Fatu, for this presentation and for providing some policy recommendations on what communities and the governments can do to support AAPs. Our last presentation will be on the cost of not investing in AAPs in West Africa. And to do this, we have Mr. Bahago Kashima from the Center for the Studies of the Economies of Africa in Nigeria to do this. So, Bahago, you can take over. You have 15 minutes. Okay. Good day, everyone. Um, I'm trying to share my screen, but um, I don't have access. Okay, I think I'll do that from my end. Okay. okay. So, so good day, everyone. Bahago Kashima is my name, as the Eunice had earlier highlighted, um, and um, I'm going to be building on what um, my other colleagues from Ghana and Sierra Leone um, have highlighted on the keys for um, accelerated education program in West Africa, considering the fact that West Africa has the highest number of out-of-school children in Africa with about 40%. So I'll be presenting um, the cost of not investing um, in, in accelerated education program, considering the high volumes of um, numbers of out-of-school children in West Africa, and specifically in um, Nigeria, Ghana, and Sierra Leone. Next, next slide, please. Yeah, so this is an introductory um, 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 section, you know, highlighting the fundamentals of education, right? Highlighting the numbers of out of school children in Nigeria, Ghana, Sierra Leone, which have already been highlighted. And then um, 
I'll be building on on the costs, you know, like the consequences of not investing in education, going by the trends of the high numbers of out of school children. Next slide, please. Okay, so based on the literature on the cost, the economic cost of not investing in education, right? Um, we were able to discover that there are economic and non-economic costs associated with not investing in education. So um, from the monetary or the economic cost perspective of not investing in education, we can tell from the literature that they are low, there will be lower lifetime earnings, you know, in these countries or on the human capital in these countries, if, you know, um, government doesn't invest, you know, in education, particularly the disadvantaged, you know, and if they don't do that, that will also lower the gross domestic product of their countries because human capital is the, is the, is the most important resource you can find in an economy. And then um, if their productivity is low, their contribution to the gross domestic product will be low. And then going further, it will also lower their national income because national income doesn't just look at the domestic monetary value from the production in country. It also inculcates um, revenues and um, profits from businesses or labor outputs of, um, of, of nationals abroad. So that um, national income is more encompassing than, than, than the gross domestic product as it were. So looking at the non-economic or non-monetary cost of non-investing in, in, in education from the literature, we will see that it will reduce health, 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 care in general which can be physical and mental in nature and and um, another another cost associated with not investing in um, another non economic cost of not investing in education is increased crime rate because um human capital has low productivity you know they are not they've not been invested in you know so there there's a high likelihood for them to get into unproductive or criminal activities. And that will also lead to higher incarceration rates and both increased crime rates and higher incarceration rates can also lead to an economic cost in terms of increased fund, um, increased social um, programs to on, 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 on law enforcement and also um, 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 court, court, court proceedings. And then another economic, um, non-economic costs associated with um, not investing in, in education is a lower civic participation and engagement. So the ability to produce um, um, productively contribute or enjoy their rights as citizens in the country is, is lower. Next, next slide, please. So, um, so, so looking at the economic impact of investing in early childhood learning, um, this 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 um, concept was um, was was conceptualized by James Heckman, as you can see on the slides. You know he tried to look at the the returns on on investing in education, particularly at the early child in, at the early stages. That is basic education. And then he's this he tried to do this by looking at the the most vulnerable children in the society. And then his finding from this try to show um shows that um higher investments at the early basic education level has a way of reducing social inequality over time as well as increasing economic productivity over time. So you can see from the chart, it shows that the returns on investment, you know, on children are higher at the early stages of their lives from parenthood, you 
is higher than early childhood, is higher than the preschool. So that means as you we grow in an as we grow on the education ladder, the investment, you know, in terms of our education diminishes over time. That means basic education is key and is at that level that investment in education is is highest in terms of returns. So next slide, please. Next slide. Next slide, please. Yunus. Okay, thank you. Can you see? Yeah. So um, so this chart chart further further built on um um this country cases to actually see what priorities you know have these countries made in terms of investing in education. So on the y axis, um, we can see expenditure on education as a share of government expenditure. On the um, x axis, we can see government expenditure on education as a share of GDP. So we can see where governments have prioritized um, 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 their expenditures in terms of education. We can see high up that Syria loan has its reasonable fair share of government expenditure on education, as well as a reasonable expenditure on education as a share of GDP. We can see other countries like Namibia, um, Botswana, Mozambique, more tilted towards um, having a significant government expenditure on education as a share of GDP compared to the expenditure on education as a share of government expenditure. We can see Ghana down there. It's actually low in terms of government expenditure as a share of GDP and then expenditure on education as a share of GDP. So that means countries are um, countries such as Uganda, Zambia, Cameroon, Ghana, Togo are doing poorly in terms of prioritizing education as it were. Next slide, please. Next slide. Okay, so this slide for now, um, Botres um, supports the earlier slides by actually focusing on the three country cases as as um um as this project is actually focused on Nigeria Ghana, and Sierra Leone. And then amongst these countries, we can see in terms of share of education's budgets total spending. You know, we can see that the um, Sierra Leone has a higher share. You know, in terms of um, 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 of of his educational budget, uh, and then followed by Ghana and Nigeria, and and then unfortunately in Nigeria that has the lowest share um, of education um, has the highest number of out of school children. So, um, we, which means um, a country like Nigeria needs to do more in terms of um, prioritizing education. Next slide, please. So, um, so in terms of computing um, um, the cost of not investing, um, uh, sorry, the, the economic cost of not investing in education, we built on um, on 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 a labor economic analysis. Sorry, is someone speaking? Hello. Okay. So, in terms of computing the economic cost of Bahago, you are muted. Bahago, continue to carry on, please. Okay, okay, okay. So basically, so in terms of um, computing the economic cost of not investing in education, we built, we focused on the labor economics and then um, um, one um, um, renowned um, economics call, uh, economist called Jacob Minsa. And um, Minsa was was um, developed. Um, um a theory around labor economics by the way one of his fundamental works on human capital and earning function laid a foundation on making us to understand um, um how investment in education and experience impacts individual um, um earnings and then we can see from this equation that actually shows um, um gdp as as a as a dependent variable 
uh, and then um, schooling, which represents um, a year of schooling and also experience um, after schooling built on um, that foundational um, 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 knowledge of findings that he made for us to be able to come up with um, uh, um, the, the economic cost of not investing in education at the macro level. So we then, next slide please. So um, going going by by Nigerians foundational work, so we 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 were able to address data from um, um, from the World Bank, and then we looked at um, a time series from 1990 to 2022, and then we looked at the media of schooling in 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 West Africa in some selected West African countries. We looked at the um, labor force participation rate, which we use as an instrumental variable. And then we looked at um, GDP, you know, which is which is the, the variable of interest to be able to actually quantify the cost, the economic cost of not uh, um, investing in, um, in education. Next slide, please. So um, this is an output um, from the analysis and we can see the stackled part you know, um, the circle part represents um, the, the the percentage loss in terms of GDP um, that these countries um, will lose if they don't um, invest in, in education. So for, for Benin, we can see that about 4.4% 4 um, 4 um, loss in GDP will occur um, if, if they don't invest in education. For Burkina Faso, it's 8.1%. Um, for Cabo Verde, it's 14.9 for Gambia is about 1.1 for Ghana is 4.1. Next slide, please. Um, for Guinea is 1.8. Um, for Liberia is 5.8. Um, for Mali is about 3.2. For Mauritania is about 2.6. For Nigeria is about 4.6. Next slide, um, that will be the last slide in terms of the um, analysis. Okay, so for Niger is about 4.0. For Senegal, 2.9. For Syria alone, 4.4. And then for Togo will be is is two point one you know of their GDP that will, they will lose if they don't um, 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 invest in um, in education. Next slide, please. So basically, the policy implication recommendations you know um, um, from from um, this study. Um, shows that the government um, um, should um, increase funding by prioritizing and allocating a, a larger budget for basic education, you know, because we can already see the implications of not investing in these numbers. And then um, we wouldn't want the already high numbers of out of school children to to increase, and then we can we can we can see this based on the the, the what UNESCO suggests that countries should aim to allocate between 46% of the GDP, um, their GDP on education to be able to address this. But further down, um, priority should be, should, should be placed more on basic education as we were able to see by Jacob, um, sorry, James Heckman's position about um, the returns on investment being highest at the basic level than um, at other um, levels of education. And then um, this, this, the second and the last in terms of um, this um, 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 research or study is that the government should take ownership of effective education innovations that aim at addressing issues of out of school children. So now basically, um, from our political economic analysis for in Nigeria, for instance, we discovered that um, there was a very slow, um, there was a very slow um, tendency for policymakers to be able to understand the um, accelerated education, you know, in in 
in an attempt to actually develop policies, institutionalize it, and then also allocate budget lines for it. But we can see over time that um, in Nigeria now that um, there's there's increased awareness on the importance of educational innovations like this. And then we just newly got um, an institution, you know, to be able to address non-formal education, just like um, the accelerated education pro um, program. But I think just little funding has been allocated to such institutions. So government needs to take further ownership of the of, of effective education innovator and uh, inno innovations like this that are that are mainly dollars to be able to actually solve their problems locally. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bahago, and to all the presenters we are so grateful for the in-depth presentations you have delivered to us next on the agenda is the question and answer session and i'll hand over to dr victoria Misachi and then marianne joy <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, we are encouraging colleagues uh, to mute uh, so that uh, we can be able to be in one house. Again, a round of applause to all our panelists. Uh, let me hand over to Marianne uh, to take us from there. Okay, it's muted. Marianne? Yes, colleagues. Yes, thank you so much. Um, I must um, also agree that uh, it was a quite in-depth, quite interesting and quite um, valuable uh, session right now. We heard quite a few um, actual results and policy recommendations. So very encouraging to see the evidence. Um, we're getting um, a few questions um, from the chat box. Let me begin. Maybe I'll give um, the first one. Um, it's from um, Mavis Sake. How are AEPs monitored and evaluated to ensure they are meeting their objectives? And what metrics or indicators are used to ensure the success of these programs? If we could linger on that question first, because I think it links up very nicely to um, the evidence that we're, that we're already seeing. So maybe uh, the speakers could, or maybe all of them or one or two of them could weigh in on that question. Again, it's how are AEPs monitored and evaluated to ensure they are meeting their objectives and what metrics or indicators are used to ensure the success of the programs? Over to you, panelists. Um, maybe I'll say a few words and then the other panelists can come in as well. Can you hear me, Mary? Yes, we can. Okay. Yes. So um, just coming back, this is a very important question, and I think all of the panelists really did address some of this, but the first, the first measurement really is the proportion and numbers of children from AEPs who complete primary school and end up transitioning to junior high school. This is very important measurement of their efficacy and impact. Then secondly, the learning outcomes, which James elaborated on in, in great detail. The foundation literacy and numeracy skills that they acquire both outside of the primary, uh, outside of the primary education system, often in local language. The results from ACER are in local language. The results from SEGRA are in English. So we measured their learning outcomes in terms of their foundation literacy and numeracy and then their transition when they were in the formal system, what were those learning outcomes in relation to their peers that had not gone through AEPs? Also, we measured ACER results in the world of work. So we measured the local language literacy and numeracy amongst children that decided not to opt to go to formal education. And if you remember from the presentation about a large proportion, 85 to 90% opt to go into formal education, they complete primary, but we're not, we're, we see a, a higher dropout in junior high school due to poverty. Thirdly, we measure these indices on gender empowerment. As Fatou well, 
really uh, explain the evidence on the empowerment of girls in terms of helping teenage mothers transition back to formal education, transition into the world of work and their level of learning outcome in terms of literacy, foundation literacy and numeracy. Finally, one of the other indicators is levels of confidence and resilience amongst girls and boys who enter AEPs and then transition into primary and junior high school. The last indices is the cost per unit. We feel that it's critical for governments to know the cost effectiveness of AEP programming and to also hold those costs downward. You know, it's no good in, in putting together an AEP program in a country where you cannot see the unit costs are lower or even more efficient than what would it be for them to go through primary. So in cases of education emergency context, we have to measure the unit cost of transitioning children, not only in the AEP, pro, but from a AEP unit cost, as well as a cost of, of transition to the formal system, if it's available. In most contexts of emergency and extreme poverty, there is no junior high school to transition to. There hardly even a primary school, sometimes in distance within a three kilometer radius. So in Guyana's case, we still see 20 to 25% of children unable to transition due to um, access issues. The final point about measurement is the cost of not investing, which I think Bahago did very well to come up with these indicators and approaches for us measuring for governments using GDP if they don't invest, they lose 4% of their GDP annually. So those are some of the points and I think other, um, you know, I think other presenters can come in now if they want to expand on those measurements and indices. But those are the four we're using. One is to complete the primary education system and junior high school, what proportion, learning outcomes, gender empowerment and cost efficiency. Can I, can I? Yes. So in terms of, I just wanted to add one more thing to um, what um, Dr. Leslie had um, earlier, earlier highlighted about the indicators, you know, towards evaluating the effectiveness. And for you to actually appreciate um, um, the indicators we use, I, will, I, I want us to understand that um, um, we should literally take the word accelerated education program to actually view it as speed school. So, um, um, you know, primary education is nine, nine years and then you have um, three years um, lower, lower secondary school, which is um, 12 years of schooling. Now, imagine you collapsing 12 years of schooling into three in the sense that the first three years of primary school is basic one, and then the second half of primary school is basic two, and then lower secondary is basic three. And then you are having beneficiaries that spent three years of schooling, having a, a learning outcome that is literacy and numeracy skills that are as good as beneficiaries that went through 12 years will actually give you a proper perspective of the effectiveness of this intervention we are trying to highlight. So I just wanted to just um, wanted to um, impute that so that you actually appreciate what um, Dr. Leslie had, had earlier highlighted in terms of the indicators. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ratu, I'd like, yeah, can I? Yes, 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 I do. Go yes, ahead. all right, okay. I just wanted to 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 add, I think Dr. Leslie has um really highlighted um the key indicators that we worked on. But the point I want to make on this platform is the question is how are AP monitored? See, I I I think that's a gap, maybe. Because um, we are coming out from an external evaluation perspective. And so we are able to, you know, look in depth into these indicators. But I, I think the point I want to make here, since this is a, a UNESCO is a strong um, 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 organized for this platform is, 
most of our innovators are not able to monitor or maybe do not have the right capacity to monitor to be able to, to sort of market their programs for additional funding. And, and so they end up, you know, at the end of say two, three years of funding, they are not able to, to showcase their achievements. So I would like us to, to flip the coin and look at, you know, what can we do to support uh, innovators to monitor their, like, I mean, simple rates like completion, just how many would complete every year of their cohorts? How many would, um, I mean, the proportion that would transition, the proportion that are retained and then go to primary school or secondary school as the case may be. So I appreciate the question so that, because I see a need to support innovators to do more internal monitoring to, to be able to show so that when external evaluators like you know, the IDRC comes in to you support. You have the permission to contribute. You can just yeah? build. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the yes. point I wanted to to make. Okay, well taken, Fatu, about the monitoring, the need for monitoring amongst the non-state actors. Sorry, over to you, um, Dr. James. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Leslie. I think one of the indicators that we didn't uh, highlight during our presentations was the scalability of AEP by the local and then uh, the central government. Indeed, Dr. Leslie's presentation did show in brief terms scalability issues across the three countries. But um, that was also lacking in some of our presentations, the three country presentations. We didn't highlight extensively on the indicator of scalability. But I think it is important to take uh, note that uh, one of the indicators of um, AEP is to what extent has a program been able to scale by the local and then the central government, and also even by the education innovators. We have seen over the years that education innovators are even upscaling AEP across adjoining communities, especially conflict prone. or hard to reach areas to include and broaden the horizon of the activities to bring on board children who are out of school. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, panelists. Let me move on to the next few questions. I think we had a clear answer there, but there's a lot of interest and a lot of questions popping up now. So I'm gonna group them together a few at a time. So we have a couple of questions. Um, someone is interested in having uh, if possible, copies or um, more information about the curricula itself from Ghana, Nigeria, and Sierra Leone. This is a request from uh, Negek. If there can be more information on the curricula themselves, maybe even copies of or parts of the curricula. There's also um, a question about how does how do AEPs fit into the changing lower secondary school curriculum in these countries. So how can or how does AEP fit into the existing uh, lower education curriculum? And then thirdly, there's a question about funding mechanisms. What funding mechanisms are available for NGOs to support the AEP initiatives? And how can NGOs leverage their resources and expertise to enhance the effectiveness of AEPs? Again, from novice. So there are a few questions. Um, availability of uh, or maybe accessibility of the curricula and self. Then we have a question about how can AEPs fit into the existing changing lower secondary school curriculum? And what kind of funding mechanisms are available for NGOs who want to uh, take on uh, AEPs? So perhaps Leslie, we can begin with you. Maybe you could also descend into questions to your colleagues. Thanks very much, um, Marianne. Okay, the first one is um, about the curriculum, and, and this was very challenging, but we were able to get copies of the three country curriculums, uh, Nigeria, Ghana, and Sierra Leone. I know the Ghana case is now reviewing their CBE curriculum, um, but they've had a long history of testing it. And I think these countries have done a lot of piloting, a lot of testing of, um, of curriculums. Sierra Leone's um, speed schools were, were re very, very robustly um, measured and the speed school curriculum is available 
it's a save the children um supported and then we have the plan Nigeria one for the Nigeria government, which I told you was the most comprehensive because it moves from lower primary to upper primary junior high school. So you do three years if you want, three years of AEP. Now, what that means is that if a child in Nigeria continues through, and Dr. Chima, I, I think, will address this in greater depth um, as well when he does his comments. But in Nigeria's case, the Nigerian government is striving towards certification of a child who completes one year of APs, transitions into upper primary, completes two years and goes to junior high school, and then three years and completes possibly the full breadth of junior high school. So these three, these curriculums are available. We have them. We will ask the governments again if we can share them to other governments and through the AU and others to disseminate. But I think they've been very well tested in Sierra Leone, Ghana, and Nigeria. So um, again, we can help to try and link those that want it. I see Uganda and Mozambique have requested it. I'm sure on this channel we could ask if we could share it with these two curriculum bodies in these two countries. Again, on the lower secondary, I'll leave that to Dr. James, but I think that we also have a lot of evidence that the children are able to transition and in most cases complete where the resources for their families are available. Um, funding mechanisms include uh, the child cannot wait, there's the Qatar fund, and there's several other um, foundations that are now starting up to secure financing for out of school children. In our communique recently, we asked governments to come together to have a source of international funding available for non-state actors in collaboration with governments to implement AEPs on the continent. So again, that's another um, potential area that it needs development. Um, so over to James to add to the questions that have been raised and then um, Fatou and Bahago. Dr. James, are you there? Online. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, Dr. Yes. James, we can hear you. Thank you. Okay, Fatou, do you want to come in while Dr. James might get his access better? Do you have anything, uh, Bahago or, or Fatou, to add to this? Just so that I think we okay, mentioned let me that. Go. Okay, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Dr. James. Go ahead, Bahago. Go ahead. Okay, so basically, I wanted to um, address the issue of how do AAPs fit into the formal education, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, I'm um, sorry, formal how how does the AAP curr curriculum fit into the formal education curriculum? So, for that question, um, I'd earlier um, made a comment after Dr. Leslie made a comment. Um, you need to understand that there is a set of children that are out of school and do not have basic education, right? And without basic education, I mean, you can't build on, I mean, basic um, basic education is like the fundamentals, like the foundation, for instance, you want to build a house, it's the foundation. So um, we are trying to see how we can give them the basic education, which is literacy and numeracy. So the curriculum is totally different, you know, and then we are using that curriculum to be able to fit them with the basic education within the shortest period of time, for them to be able to transition and meet their cohorts, you know, in the formal system. So that means the curriculum for AEPs is totally different from the curriculum of the formal system. It's more or less complementary. Help is focused on the disadvantaged um, 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 set of children. 
And then for the second question on the availability of the curriculum, um, I feel um, our access to the curriculum right now from the government is mainly focused on research basis. So I feel that um, um, the interested parties for the curriculum can reach out to the government themselves directly, you know, because we don't necessarily know the modalities at which uh, uh, we can share these curriculums, you know? So I, 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 I just felt I should drop that. Thank you. Thank you, Bahago. Thank you. So um, any points, Fatou? Um, okay, go ahead. Go ahead, Jim. Okay, so this is Jim. I was trying to elaborate on the curriculum. Um, in, in the case of Ghana, it is built on to what the existing curriculum for the lower um, level of education is. So the targets or the content of the AEP curriculum focuses on the basics of understanding literacy and numeracy to prepare them so that when they are formally transitioned into the formal system, they'll be able to adjust and then be able to learn at a faster speed. So basically, the curriculum that the, the NGOs and of course the uh, complementary education agency is using is a product of what the formal education systems curriculum looks like. But the focus basically is on numeracy and literacy at its basic and simplified form. Thank you. Fatu? For, for funding, oh, what Dr. Oh, Leti already said is, is, is the same. Yeah, so the funding sources, as you presented, remains the same in terms of my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the only, uh, um, thank you. Uh, my colleagues have addressed the questions, but I just wanted to shift a little bit to the left, the question that was raised, uh, maybe use this opportunity to share some of the findings. There is this aspect of the learning environment and um, which um, and, and, and the AAP beneficiaries' preferences. We also looked into that and we found that they, they, they leaned very you know, strongly to the, to the learning environment that the AEPs uh, provide that facilitators are more flexible, facilitators create more of a one-to-one -one engagement, facilitators have a personal relationship in which they, they actually visit them in case, for example, there's a, they're absent from classes and sessions. So we didn't have uh, the opportunity to, to, to present that, but I think it's an important point to bring that mm. because they are more um, older learners, we found that um, in the AEP environment, which was more flexible, they were tending to lean towards that kind of environment, the local language being used more often, um, aspects like that. And I think I think it's good when we're talking about curriculum, um, let's look at this, these other behaviors that may be hidden within a curriculum. Mm -hmm. So um, let, I mean, in, 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 in wanting to scale up, we should be looking at how, how do these positives that we're seeing in the AAP environment can be used in the in the formal. They also like that they were not caned. They are not caned. They were, they were not caned in the AAP, but they are caned in the formal system. So mm -hmm. I, I think those are all food for thoughts. That's what I wanted to throw in. Thank you. And just to um, finalize on this, Marianne, is, is that as Fatou has said, there's sub success points in which an AEP runs on. One of it is community-based and the facilitators are selected by the community. So they're usually senior high school graduates, but they usually, they have to know the mother tongue because most of the AEPs operating in Nigeria and Ghana to some degree in other, well, Mali and other countries, it's local language. So they're learning in the nine months to break through the literacy in the nine months using phonic and syllabic approaches in mother tongue before they transition either to formal education or a higher level of AEP. So one of the key success points that we've identified in these programs over the last 20 years is that they are community driven because they select their, their facilitators from the community. Secondly, that they're volunteers. Often they're not paid a tenth of what a teacher is paid. Um, in the case of Ghana, it's less than twelve. It's less than uh, a tenth of the normal salary of a of a teacher. 
Um, and then I've mentioned phonic and syllabic approaches. And finally, I just want to mention a little more about funding. Um, it's not a very strong funding mechanisms, but there are uh, availability for leveraging by governments where NGOs could go into collaboration and partnership with government to source funding from USAID. USAID has a window. Qatar Foundation has a window. SEEDS and GPE are all opportunities for the non-state actors to leverage and work with the government in implementing AEPs in the most difficult and deprived areas of the continent. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Leslie. Marianne, are you there? Yes, Victoria. Yes. Thank you so much, Leslie, and thank you, panelists, for those responses. I really didn't want to intervene while you were speaking. Um, we're running a little short on time for questions, but we have so many questions that have been coming up into the chat box, and really this feels like we need to start the next webinar on August 31st with these questions. Um, mm -hmm. Comments as well. I think some of the takeaways for me from the, the, the chat box. Uh, sorry, someone is not on mute. So I saw that there was um, a couple of questions that to me seem as if you have made your point through your evidence today. There was one comment asking, how do we expand this AEP model for all African countries to reach children who are out of school? So it seems like with, with that comment, you have made your point. You have convinced us that this is something that we should be considering and something that governments should be doing. So I'll just leave the comments at that. I think we need to begin the next session with these questions and comments. Um, otherwise, we might be here for another hour and a half just, just going through the excellent comments from the chat room. Um, if I could please move on and ask uh, Eunice uh, Bodza to call on the next speaker. We're going to hear some observations and some reflections at the country level. So um, Eunice, over to you, please. Thank you very much, Victoria. So we'll be taking some observations and recommendations from Nigeria and Ghana. So for Nigeria, we have Dr. Chima. He's the director for the Nigeria Educational Research and Development Council. Dr. Chima, over to you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Yeah. Uh... I think I participated in this webinar to follow through with uh, the research finding. And I find it quite interesting, you know, the extent to which the research has gone to highlight uh, some of the critical issues that has to do with uh, accelerated education program in the West African sub-region. And this is of particular interest to us who are in Nigeria. Uh, because the AEP is something we found very uh, appropriate to our context. Uh, this is in terms of meeting the huge need of the number of out of school children and youth, which the government is trying to provide education for. And over the years, we've not been able to find a lasting solution to this challenge uh, because these learners, uh, these children uh, find opportunities, but then after a short period, they relapse and go back to their usual estate. But with the coming of AEP and the adoption in Nigeria, since uh, I would say officially since 2019, uh, we found it very uh, functional in providing quality education program for the children who are out of school and are over age. Uh, what we, we've done so far in this country is to make sure that we provide them equivalent educational program, this is in terms of content and learning approach, so that when they transition into the formal school program, they're able to cope effectively. Because we found this very challenging, uh, previous effort to provide them AEP, uh, focusing just on some areas of literacy and numeracy failed in our context, because these children, when they get into the formal school, and then they start meeting uh, subjects or learning areas like uh, the basic science and technology. They start meeting concepts and issues that have to do with uh, civic and uh, social studies. And then they tend to find it much more challenging as they were unable to cope. 
So in designing our own AEP, we designed it to suit our peculiar context. And what did we do? We we'll tried to ensure that we provide an equivalent learning content that they will also meet in the formal school program. So in Nigeria, we have uh, uh, five subjects that the children are expected to undergo, but well condensed, uh, avoiding repetitions, uh, taking cognizance of uh, the uh, cognitive maturities of the learners. So in Nigeria, we have the literacy and numeracy, which is very fundamental and key. And most of the learnings are focused on those areas, but to also have these other subject areas that has to do with the basic science and technology and what we call in the Nigerian history and values, which takes care of issues around the history, uh, social studies and uh, civic education. And then we also have one Nigerian language where the learners are expected to uh, you know, undergo, so to build their foundation effectively. So the learners take these subjects and then the transition, uh, like Dr. Leslie mentioned, the transition at the appropriate level at the, at the upper primary and then lower uh, secondary, the transition at this level. And they also are prepared to also transition at the senior secondary level. Uh, the good thing that has happened with us is that currently the children have completed uh, writing the uh, final examination, which is the basic education certificate examination which will now qualify those who have gone through the three levels of AEP in Nigeria to transit to senior secondary. And uh, it might interest you to know that these children are performing very well. Their results have shown that, yeah, that AEP is functional, AEP is working, AEP is adequate for them, and it meets their needs. And the, the good thing, again, is that because it is a flexible program, these children find it very easy to cope, you know, in spite engaging in other economic activities that they do to support their uh, livelihood, support their parents, and, uh, and you know, uh, also engage in other social activities. They still find AUP very adequate for them because of its flex flexible nature. So for us, uh, we find AUP as a way for the government to go, and the government have adopted it. Uh, the governments across the states, you know, the regions of the country have adopted it and is functional uh, we're at the point of scaling up to the uh, across all the states and regions of the country and uh, uh, it's, it's, it's moving very fast. Uh, recently uh, we had a program where we had discussions with some state governments who are now showing interest to adopt the program uh, you know in the southern region of the country where we're having challenges of adoption and implementation and uh, so, because government yeah. has Taking Sorry, over fully. To uh, we have run out of time. I'm just going to request okay. participants yeah. to give us um, maybe like 10 more minutes. So I just request that you wrap it up so that we can allow the next person to speak and then we conclude it in the next 10 minutes. Please bear with us and apologies for overshooting the time. Thank you. Back to you. Yeah, please. Bear. Thank you very much. So I think. Uh, uh, what I'm trying to put across is for us as a country in Nigeria, uh, as a country, uh, AEP is the way to go for us. Uh, it's been formally adopted in the country and the clear curriculum developed for it, clear pathways uh, developed for it, clear guidelines developed for it, and implementation is currently ongoing, ongoing and government has taken ownership across the states. So we're also pushing for, you know, uh, a national uh, adoption across some other states where we're having some challenges because they are yet to accept the fact that this is also for them. But for us in Nigeria, AEP is the way to go and we're on it. And uh, we're sure that in the, couple, in the next couple of years, more states in the country will have adopted the, uh, the program for providing education for out of school children and youth. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Chima. It's good to know that you're doing so much work in ensuring that AEPs are skilled up in other parts of Nigeria. So I would invite Mr. Philip Day from the Complementary Education Agency of Ghana to also give some observations and recommendations. Mr. Day, you have the floor. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this greeting is coming on behalf of the Complementary Education Agency Management. Uh, our executive 
deputy executive director in charge of operation is also on the line. And the same greeting is from the Ministry of Education. Per the observation, what we want to say is that the CBE program is currently now under the four main programs of the complementary education agency. Others which include remedial education, functional literacy education, as well as uh, occupational skills development. However, the AEP or the CBE program has been identified as one of the best programs and opportunity to address the out of school challenge across the group, across the continent, and within every country. Uh, the key point to note is that if this is the case, then it is important that all stakeholders, whether from the public or the private sector, researchers and advocacy workers, we are all entreated to continue to propagate the evidence and the benefit of out-of-school education programs. To us at the Complementary Education Agency, we will say that it is even the Complementary Basic Education Program that is still emphasizing on the benefits of foundational learning and the benefits of education to how to reach communities. Uh, it is also to note that even though all the presentation highlighted the evidence and the benefits that has been achieved or chalked so far in the CBE program or AEP program implementation, uh, there are still issues associated with transition and completion of learners. In the sense that many learners after transitioning because they are from disadvantaged families and communities. Their survival within the education space becomes a difficulty, especially girls. Before we realize, quite a number are unable to complete as we expect them. So as much as we are making the evidence for the program implementation to ensure that learners are transitioning into the former school. It is calling for another opportunity which we all need to explore. That is supporting learners who have been transitioned into the complementary basic education, from the complementary basic education program into former school. In the sense that these learners will be tracked during the transition process and those who are still seem to be at the risk of dropping out should be supported in such a way that they will be able to remain in school and complete successfully. Uh, we also want to stay that, state that even though we are establishing the evidence by research across the country so far, it is still evident that the numbers for, of intervention for out-of-school learners still remain low across the sub-region and in every country. This means that if we state that the complementary basic education program or accelerated education programs is the major innovation for addressing the out-of-school challenge, then we as researchers, we as communicators, and we as advocacy groups are required to promote a rich communication to ensure that there is a collaborative and innovative funding, both from government sector, the private operators, development partners, and the private sector as at large, to invest into this program to the extent that these high numbers of out-of-school children across the continent, across the sub-region, and within our respective countries will be reduced to the barest minimum. And if not, then we should be removed, totally eradicating the challenge and always 
come together and share the praises of the success that we have done it again. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Dear. Thank you. I now call on the Kicks Africa 19 Hub team to give us the closing remarks. Thank you so much, Eunice. Um, before we, we go there, if I could please, um, um, okay, I want to also remind you about the survey link before we, we conclude. Uh, so colleagues, there has been so much learning happening in the past two hours. I think it's clear from the, the high engagement and clear from the chat box. If you just take a look, we have had so many excellent comments and observations. So I would like to invite everybody to give us in just two to three minutes maximum your feedback on a survey link that I have posted in the chat box. I'm posting it again now. Um, it's a very, very short survey, but this is really crucial for us to have our own quality assurance to make sure that we're achieving our outcomes for these types of virtual learning sessions and that we can address your lingering questions and even improve for next time. So the comments, you can just see the last comment in the chat box from Victoria. She has reshared the survey link. It's very, very short, but it's very, very important for us. Um, and we will also have a, a follow-up session to this one on August 31st. So in exactly a month, we'll be having another discussion on this same topic, maybe from this, this perspective that we're seeing now of uh, community involvement, um, the need for sustainability, uh, family, parental involvement. There were some really interesting comments that touched on the, the practical and the, the, the community and sustainability school-based side of where do we go next with the, with the uh, AEPs. Um, uh, and then um, finally, um, could we take a quick group photo together? It's something that we'd like to do uh, when we're still here in the same room. So if you could please everyone turn on your cameras for a moment um, okay. before, we, we, before we conclude. Okay, turn yes. on our cameras. Okay, I'm seeing a lot of beautiful faces. Let's have a few more, please. And stay on the line. I'll have to take several since we are such a, a big room. I wanna try to capture everybody. Wow, everyone looks so great. Okay. Raphael, Janet, if you can turn on your cameras as well. A few more people as well, I see, could turn on their cameras. Okay, please stay on until I say that we're done. We'll have to take about three. Okay, here's one. Okay, the next group. And another one. Okay, thank you so much, everyone. Um, now, I would like to ask um, uh, our colleagues from IDRC, uh, Mr. Patrick, to come in to give his remarks. Um, was uh, unable to come in at the beginning. Uh, and um, I'd like to ask him to come in to share some uh, thoughts, reflections on, um, on today's uh, session before we, we conclude. So please, over to you. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, mine would be a very short one, it would be a very short one, just a vote of thanks. I would like on behalf of uh, IDRC and on behalf of the GPE Kicks team, uh, I would like to thank you. Thank you, the organizers, the UNESCO bar team, uh, Dr. Victoria Tsache and Marianne, we thank you so much for putting us together and our partners associates for change and the partners uh, uh, that you're working with. Thank you so much. This has been very, very insightful. So many questions and interesting stuff that is coming through. Um, just to re-echo that such space uh, lines very well with our core interest of having um, uh, promoting the use of research and making sure that it's impacting day-to-day -day activities. So uh, especially the, the research that is generated through our applied research uh, projects uh, and the hub uh, really provides 
a, a very good opportunity and provides a very good space to have this. So thank you so much. So on behalf of the KICS team and behalf of IDRC and my colleagues who are not here, thank you so much. And we thank you all the participants that have come. Uh, I think at some point we are nearly hitting about 150. Uh, so that, that's a good number. So thank you so much. Thank you for all the questions that have been asked. I'm sure the team is going to try and respond to all of those. I'm looking forward to seeing you on the 31st um, uh, uh, later in the month. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much, Patrick. Oh, yes, over to you, Victoria. No, Marian. I just want to say uh, thank you to everybody because the webinar has ended officially and thank you for giving us the time. I've taken note of every comment that was put in the chat room and we are going to be uh, looking at these comments in our next webinar. Please don't miss out on 31st. We shall address more of these comments and we shall have another beautiful set of speakers and uh, we look to we look forward to seeing you and thank you so much, Dr. Patrick, for being available. Uh, may you have a blast. I know people are still joining in up to the very end. So have a beautiful, uh, beautiful evening. Uh, no, yes, evening for East Africa and then for West Africa. I think it's afternoon or something like that. So wish you all the best and have a nice, nice day. See you again. Bye-bye. Thank you so much to the AFC team. Oh, my goodness. Kudos for the, all the speakers. Thank you very much. I've literally had to do it physically to clap my hands. Powerful papers. We really appreciate you, colleagues. Thank you so much. And see you on 31st. Don't miss. Same time. And uh, we'll be sending out the invites very, very soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.